Okay, everyone, welcome to our new semester. This class is Introduction to Biology or Biology 2230, and this is the first of your lecture videos that you will be watching online. Um, before you start this, please make sure you have laid your foundation for this class. That includes reading the syllabus, reading the addendum. Um, there were some assignments with that, including taking the syllabus quiz and making sure that you um, had some study goals that you completed. Please make sure that you have kind of looked over D2L, you understand how the course is going to be run, you understand how to access your materials. And if you have any confusion in any of those things, you've written to me or come by my office hours or we can talk um, when we meet in person. If that is finished, then let's jump in. Um, I am Sarah Hill, I am your instructor this semester and Microbiology is what I absolutely love, so I am really excited to have this semester to share my passion with you. So your first assignment is to think about what you've already heard about microbiology. Uh, maybe there was a story in the news. You know, it wasn't that long ago we were having a COVID pandemic and that dominated the news. Um, but there's also some other things. Maybe you've heard something about the flu, maybe about Ebola or monkeypox. Um, maybe something just on the radio during your morning commute. Maybe something that you saw on the news that um, you, something that you've experienced yourself. If you can't think of anything um, off, offhand, a good website is the CDC publishes the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Index. And in this Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Index, they talk about what is going on in microbiology this week. Um, so it's very up-to-date, current, what is the big, big issues in microbiology. This is its website, cdc.gov slash mmwr slash index dot html. So I want you to find one reference in the news, and I want you to share that in your discussion board, since we're not meeting in class, is in person in class. I want you to share that on your discussion board, and we will discuss um, the website that you used, um, a little bit about what you found out, what disease or, or incidents, what you're studying, looking at, uh, a little bit about what you found out. Um, and then go back, read what your classmates said, comment on a few of them, um, you know, actually discuss the science of what's going on. Um, one thing, just to be aware, some of these articles are written for professionals, for um, medical researchers or doctors, and so they may be difficult to understand, especially some of the technical language of it, and that's okay. You don't have to be the expert yet. You get to be the student who's still learning. Um, but hopefully if you read through it, at least an abstract or an intro of some of these bigger articles, you'll at least be able to get something from it. So that's your first job. Pause um, and come back when you're ready to move on. So in this, this semester, we are going to be talking about microbiology. Biology means the study of life, and micro means the study of little life. So microbiology is the study of little life. And when we say little things, we don't just mean little like a bug. We mean little like too small to see with your eyes just by themselves. Microorganisms or microbes, you can use those words interchangeably, are so small that you have to see them with a microscope. You can't just look at your hand and see what's there. Microbes include bacteria, fungi, protozoa, algae, and viruses. We'll spend most of the semester focusing on bacteria, but we'll also cover all of these microbes this semester. You'll be able to tell me how they're similar or different. You'll be able to tell me how they get energy, how they grow, how they can cause disease, how they can do good things for us, um, how we can treat them, all sorts of things relevant. This course is especially focused for um, pre-medical, like pre-nursing or cardiovascular or dental hygiene, those kind of medically related careers. Um, it's also great for people who are going into biology, just so we understand how the biology of these living things are working. Um, and sometimes you'll see this word germ. Germ is kind of a more layman's term that we sometimes use. It means a rapidly growing cell. Um, I'll try to avoid using that during class because it's not really that professional of a word. Um, and, and so we'll, we're going to try to kind of stay away from using that word. 
if you think about microbes in our lives, if I said you have microbes all over your hand or on your teeth, it probably makes you want to squirm and wash your hands and brush your teeth, you know, get rid of them all. Um, but in reality, few microbes around us are pathogenic. That means disease causing. So most microbes on our planet don't cause disease. Most microbes on our planet actually support our ability to be alive, um, which really makes sense if you think about it. The first life on earth were microbes. Um, our human bodies evolved in a world that was dominated with microbes. And so it's not surprising that our lives, our bodies, um, depend on microbes in a lot of ways. Some things that microbes do, one is decompose organic waste. So every organism that has died, every dropping left behind um, by, by an animal, um, every leaf that's fallen from a tree, they're not still just sitting there on the ground because they have decomposed. And a lot of that decomposition has happened because microbes are there. Microbes also perform photosynthesis, which generates oxygen, which allows us to breathe. Um, it also allows um, carbon dioxide to be converted into sugars and things that we can use for our own energy. Um, so photosynthesis is something we are absolutely dependent on, both for having oxygen and for food. Um, we can use microbes to produce chemicals like acetone, ethanol, vitamins. Some of these they naturally produce. Um, we can even take a bacteria and engineer it to produce chemicals that we need. Um, your textbook talked about how it can be used, how microbes can be used to um, produce a lot of the steps in making a pair of blue jeans even. Microbes produce fermented foods, things like this picture of beer, this cheese, vinegar, bread. All of these foods are possible because of microbes. There would be no alcohol. There would be no vinegar. There would be no um, milk turning into cheese if we did not have microbes doing those things. Um, along with producing chemicals, I can also produce manufacturing products, something like cellulose. And they can also be engineered to produce products for treatment like insulin. You can take a bacteria to, um, you can take a bacteria and modify it so it starts making insulin or other treatments that you want to make. We can make vaccines and other drugs using, using microbes. Understanding how microbes work can help you um, as a person who likes to eat. It can prevent food spoilage. You know how to take care of your food, where you should store your food, um, what food is safe to eat. It can also help prevent disease occurrence. That's probably the big thing that most of you are taking in this class to prevent diseases in your future patients. Understanding microbes also allows us to develop aseptic techniques. This will prevent contamination, um, which is important to have not con not have contamination when you are performing surgery, when you are making medicines, when you're working in a lab, you want your lab results to be correct. You don't want to contaminate your patient. You don't want to contaminate the medicines or the materials you're making. You also don't want to contaminate yourself as you're working with things that potentially have some microbes in it. You don't want to take those home for yourself or your family or your friends. Next, let's talk about our microbiome. This is another very important benefit that microbes provide. In a typical adult body, there are about 30 trillion cells, but a lot of research suggests that in that body, there are 40 trillion bacterial cells. That means there's more bacteria cells on your body than there are people cells. That's before you even start counting the other microbes that could be there, like a fungus or a protozoan or a virus. Um, these bacterial cells that live on your body, they live there, they're stable, they can be there from the time you're born until the day you die. They are not causing disease. This is what your microbiome is. And they do a lot of benefits for you. Um, they help maintain good health. They can send signals from your um, from, your, from where they are to your brain to maintain mental health. They can send signals into your digestive system to help you digest food. 
Um, they can help prevent the growth of pathogenic microbes. In one sense, just having a microbe there, having a good microbe there, means there's not space for a bad guy to move in. So you don't have that pathogen coming in making you sick. Sometimes these these parts of your microbiome can even make chemicals. They can make antibiotics that would actively kill a pathogen that came in. So they stop microbes, they stop pathogens from growing in. They also help train your immune system that having these healthy bacteria help your immune cells learn how to fight pathogens and learn how to tolerate things that are not dangerous. So having this microbiome reduces your risk of having autoimmune diseases, things like arthritis, um, that when your immune system is in balance, it's able to take care of your own body and kill the threats. A lot of that is done by your microbiome. Um, your microbiome are all the organisms that you acquire but are not making you sick. You can start acquiring them as a newborn Babies passing through the birth canal pick up some of their mother's biota. Um, and even babies that are born by cesarean, sometimes the birth attendants will swab some of the mother's um, some of the mother's birth canal and swab that onto the baby to give them access to that biome. Um, breast milk contains lots of not only um, organisms to seed their microbiome, but also contains a lot of sugars that people can't digest. But that microbes can, so it helps feed those microbes. And throughout your life, depending on you know what hormones you have, whether you're taking antibiotics, what foods you're eating, what you're what you're exposed to, your pets, other people, these all affect the microbiome that you're going to be building. Um, colonization of microbes are only going to occur at body sites that provide the right nutrients and the right environment for microbes to flourish. So different parts of your body have different temperatures. They have different moisture content, different access to oxygen. Um, they're going to have different, different chemicals and other um, nutrients available. So different sides of your body, like your armpit, is going to be different from your eyeball, which is going to be different from inside your intestines. And so you'll have different types of microbes colonizing different parts of your body. When the microbes colonize your body, they might be there indefinitely. So for the rest of your life, or they might just be fleetingly. So maybe you're playing um, tackle football. Someone touches you, a little bit of their microbes get onto your skin, but your body doesn't really provide for them to stay there. So they're just there for a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months. That's your transient microbiome. It's there on your body, but it's not there permanently. So it's transient. That's your transient microbiome. Two studies that have gone on about the microbiome, one is the Human Microbiome Project, and one is the National Microbiome Initiative. The Human Microbiome Project started in 2007, um, trying to figure out what exactly is in our microbiome and how do those affect diseases. And the, the National Microbiome Initiative, which started in 2016, was to explore different roles that microbes play in different parts of your body, the different ecosystems of your body. So both of these are fairly new within the last 20 years. So this is still a very growing, emerging science. Um, if you go into microbiology research, these are things that you could contribute knowledge to, to our world. Okay, the last thing we're gonna talk about in this video is how we name and classify organisms. The system of naming or nomenclature was developed by Carolus Linnaeus, this is him in 1735. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate dates, but it is good to know who these people are and what they've done. So Carolus Linnaeus developed a system of nomenclature. In this, each organism has two names. Um, so in humans, this would be Homo sapiens. In a mouse, this would be Mus musculus. In bacteria, this might be E. coli or Staphylococcus aureus. Two names. The first name is the genus, which is capitalized, and the second name is a specific epithet, which is lowercase. Always. Genus is capitalized, specific epithet is lowercase. Both, if you're handwriting it, both will be underlined. If you're typing it, both will be italicized. Always. Please pay attention to this. This will be a question on quizzes and exams. 
When you write lab papers, you will lose points if you don't have proper nomenclature. Genus capitalized, specific epithet, lowercase, both underlined or italicized. Um, the same names are used worldwide. So this makes it easy to, you know, you can go to a conference in Japan or in, in South Africa or in Paris, and it'll be the same names used worldwide. Oftentimes, the names of microbes are descriptive. So just seeing the name, you know a little bit about what microbe you're dealing with. Sometimes it's named to honor a scientist, um, maybe the scientist who discovered it, or a scientist who was um, an influential or someone that the scientist who discovered it liked. So let's look at these two different bacteria. One is E. coli. So here, Escherichia is the genus. It is capitalized. Coli is a specific epithet, and it is lowercase. And the whole thing is italicized. The first name, Escherichia, the genus, um, is named after this guy, Theodore Escherich. He's the guy who discovered this bacteria. The second part, coli, is named after the colon, which is where this bacteria is found. Okay, another bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus. Here, genus, Staphylococcus is capitalized, aureus. Aureus is lowercase. Um, and this refers to the name Staphylococcus refers to how it appears. Um, Staphylo means clusters and co cocci means spherical. So you can see these are clusters of little spheres, clusters of little balls. The specific epithet aureus is after its appearance. Um, the word aureus means gold. So you can see they're kind of gold colored clusters of balls. Um, also, when you're reading or writing a lab paper, after the first time you are you use their name, you'll say Escherichia coli. But after that, you can abbreviate it to say E. coli. The first time you'll say Staphylococcus aureus. After that, you'll say S. aureus. So at this point, you should be able to understand some principles that we've dis discussed. So what are some destructive and beneficial actions of microbes? What percentage of all the cells in the human body are bacterial cells? And what effect do those bacterial cells have on our body? And how would you write the scientific name for humans in correct nomenclature? Okay, so take some time to answer those. Make sure that you have updated your study guide or your class notes with those. And I will see you back for our next discussion when we start talking about our different types of microbes. We'll start discussing how a bacteria or an archaea or a virus or a fungus, how these are similar or different. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye.